gives me an SME curve. And an SME curve describes the scale unit of the user case. So these are all nice, mathematically well-defined statements. So uh, we are quite happy with uh, this understanding of the interfaces. So then, there's uh, maybe a next question. What if you have several interfaces? I was just looking at one. But of course, I could have uh, several at the same time. And they are not independent, of course. So there's some interaction. So they will be interacting interfaces. So here I'm having some segments of the boundary in my model to have one color, so black. And the other segments another color, this uh, uh, red. Maybe plus and minus again, like for the easy model. And I can ask, what what is the limiting distribution of the family of these kind of interfaces connecting these several other points? And this is of course the family of these SME curves. So just to tell you what it is, here is a precise statement. So I'm fixing. Again, let's say the square, I just rotate it in the picture so it fits better. Uh, the square lattice there times delta, delta is going to zero. So I get some kind of continuum domain which is the square and this mark boundary points. And I take a certain uh, geometric sense of convergence in a parathetic sense for my all of these domains. So that I keep track of the geometric properties. And let's also say that I, I, I say that uh, x5 and x6 are connected by one interface, x4 and x1 by one interface, and x3 and x2 by one interface, so that my curves always connect the same uh, given points. It's a bit easier. And in this setup, you can say that a similar theorem rules, and now just the limiting object, is, uh, I'm calling it NSME, because there's some capital N number of interfaces here. And it's the same speed for the ground motion, but now there's also interaction between all these curves. And uh, the proof idea is quite similar, so you need again to have a chance of convergence, so some kind of relative compactness for these sequences of now families of curves, indexed by delta. And then you need to identify what the limiting object is. So that's the more difficult step. And for the experts, there are a couple of ways to do this. So method A would be use a more general holomorphic observable, so generalization of the one curve case. And method B would be, as I'm presenting here, using the information that we already know one interface and uh, induction argument. So I'm going to present that on the next slide. I should maybe mention, so this is joint with Hans and Pepper and Halu, and that's previous work by Kostin Zurov, who's probably in the audience, uh, establishing this convergence in a slightly different sense. And we get uh, of, uh, supplementary results. Okay, so this is an analog of several interface convergence, and I need to tell you what the limiting object is. So here is a uh, definition. It's uh, quite intuitive. So forget about the colors. In the picture, let's just say I have my domain. Now I have several boundary points marked, and I'm connecting them by some curves, and the curves are random. I'm only fixing the end points on the boundary, but inside the domain they fluctuate, and they are not allowed to cross or intersect, so there's some interaction. And uh, I'm also fixing how they connect. So alpha is denoting the connection pattern. That is just a planar pair partition for the mark points on the boundary. So don't worry too much about that. So I have a family of interrupting curves, random curves. What I can do is the following. So if I already know one curve, maybe the red one in the picture, uh, it splits the domain into two parts. And in the smaller parts, I have several curves, but with a smaller number of uh, points. So I could intuitively try to describe it uh, by first understanding one curve, then two curves, and so on. 
So that's one way. The more efficient way is the uh, kind of uh, a complement to this one, saying that if I own already know n minus one curves, so I have n curves in total, I know everybody except the red one. Uh, then these other ones, they are bounding some kind of domain, this shaded domain where the red one can be because it cannot touch the other ones. And then I'm saying that the red one must be distributed as the SLE curve in the shaded domain between these two points. So this is the one curve case we already discussed. And this is what we understand. And if this property holds, no matter which guy I choose to be the red one, uh, then this is the measure I'm looking for. Now the question is whether this is unique. And the result is that there is a unique such measure. So this is a theorem and definition at the same time again. Uh, it's a bit more bold. So there's a funny parameter range because of technical reasons. Don't worry about that. This is, uh, let's say, kappa is less than 4. This is meaning that my curves are simple curves, as I didn't want to talk about the other cases. So I'm fixing these boundary points, and I'm asking uh, how many probability measures on these families of curves I have, with the property that if I know everybody else except the red one, the red one is just the usual SA curve, but in this random gray shaded domain bounded by the other curve. So symmetry for any choice of the red curve. And the uh, result is that there's a unique measure on families of curves with this property. And this is what I call the NSLE. And uh, there's lots of work by many people from different viewpoints about this. Uh, this kind of definition, so there's work by Miller, Sheffield and Werner for the two curve case. We, we did the general case again with one sum and and uh, the proof idea is uh, not too bad. So maybe you, you're worried about these probability measures on the curves, which has some very you know huge space and uh, uh, uncountable and all that. But what you can do, you can do actually a Markov chain argument. Uh, nevertheless, that the space Markov chain is living on is a little bit bad, just it's a certain a priori estimate. So what's going on? So maybe I can draw a picture and uh, explain the two uh, cases. So the idea is very simple. So remember that uh, we, we understand the one curve case. So if there's one, one curve, we understand. Let's say we have two curves, so there's another one. And I want to generate this kind of measure using the Markov chain. So what I do, I start with some whatever uh, initial configuration. Then I decide that I'm resampling one of the curves again. So maybe the rightmost one. So I keep the leftmost one. So I have a leftmost curve and the rightmost curve. I keep the leftmost one. I resample the rightmost one. In the component, uh, right to the curve that I kept because uh, of course I cannot cross. So I resample that one from the one curve measure. This is what I understand. So maybe it becomes a bit different. And I can continue doing this resampling and uh, the claim is that this procedure converges to this uh, uni unique uh, invariant distribution and this is my multiple essay measure. Uh, it's a uh, quite big uh, explanation, but I hope the idea becomes somewhat intuitive. So the point was that once we understood uh, the one uh, scaling limit of one interface in the Ising model, then we can understand also scaling limits of several interfaces, like in this picture. Uh, okay, so I said there are a few things we can mathematically uh, rigorously uh, prove about the Ising model and about some other critical models. 
and where we can see this quantum asymmetry, which, uh, which is uh, considered so important in the physical models. Of course, symmetry is important because they are restricting your, your models, and you can study uh, the interesting observables more easily if you can impose some constraints. So, uh, this is the second uh, player in, in our game. So, this is about correlations in this model. And, uh, yeah, I should mention for the experts, these are, of course, related to correlation functions in these field theories. But, let's not worry about too much about that. It's kind of where, where we are trying to aim at when we are proving all these things. But there's still, there's still work to do. So, here is a result about the correlations of the spins in the easing model. So remember in the easing model I had a finite graph on the vertices I put plus and minus uh, pluses and minuses randomly, so they are spins and there's a certain probability measure for them. And then I can ask how they are correlated in if I take a spin at x and a spin at y, what is how much do they talk to each other? And I'm looking at this critical temperature where uh, cell similarity and interesting phenomena are happening. And there I said the correlations decay polynomially in the distance of x and y. But I can say more. So, Chelva, uh, Conner is zero, proved not so long ago. You can take two spins or several spins. You can look at the, how they are correlated. You need to renormalize by this delta to certain power. Delta was the size of my mesh in the graph. But if you renormalize, then you get a non-trivial limit, which depends on the positions of the spins, of course. And it's, uh, it's not quite invariant under control maps. So if you're scaling, you actually get a factor, scaling factor, which is this uh, derivative of the control map to some power. So they are covariant. This is what we expect. Uh, in, in general, it's not so explicit, but uh, we can understand them via certain properties, like this component invariant. Maybe in some nice domain, we can write it explicitly, and we can transform to other using component maps. There are also certain other things, uh, for example, differential equations that they satisfy, which uh, appear in the physics literature. There's another one if I have time, so you will see this again. Let's skip it for now, because it's more intuitive in another setup. Uh, of course, they should be real value because the expectations are something. Maybe it's not a priori clear from the formulas, and so on. So that's one example of correlations that you can that survive in the uh, scaling limit when delta goes to zero after normalizing by power of delta and that can be said to be conformally invariant modulo this scaling and you can also relate these properties to something in the physics model but I'm not going to talk about that in, in this talk oh, I jumped so just to mention that I'm always talking about the easy model and the spins there there are other observables you can study. So for the easy model, there are energy, so-called uh, so energy density operators, and you can take mixtures of different operators, and you, you obtain uh, analogous results on, of that sort by the same people and some others. So now, in my remaining time, let me talk about the third uh, feature that we can mathematically understand. This is kind of analogous to the correlations, but now I'm having a more geometrical description. So again, there are all these interfaces, and I'm asking about probabilities of certain connections between regions in my model. And um, if you look at your uh, graph, model on the graph, everything is finite, so in principle you would say uh, you could calculate everything, but it doesn't seem so plausible to do, so you cannot really find formulas for these things in the discrete model unless you are in a very special situation. But when you take the scaling limit, 
They are also going to zero. In some cases, you find explicit formulas. In some cases, maybe not explicit, but you have some nice properties for the limiting object, like the ones that I just flashed, these differential equations. And uh, these appear in the uh, quantum field theory literature in the physical codes. So that's one way for us to connect our knowledge about the risk rate model and its scaling limit to the physical theory, which is a priori ill-defined, but some features of it can be well-defined, and then we can build on that. So that's kind of the big goal. Uh, let's see, I have a couple of minutes, so I think I can maybe state, state you what's going on in this third uh, character here. So we are still dealing with the same model, so I'm having these several interfaces now, so I'm having segments on the boundary, having a plus or minus spins, and now I can ask the question maybe the, let's see, uh, northwest corner, whether that's connected to the south, uh, let's see, northeast corner, for example, like that, or whether it's not connected. So there are different kind of connections that can happen that you can hopefully see in the pictures. If not, you can picture the square with the, or the four corners marked and you ask whether there's a connection from left to right of one color. So what's the probability of that event? And if you take the scaling limit, you will find that it's actually a conforming invariant number. So that's kind of nice. And in general, you have more complicated uh, things like that. And uh, what we can say about it is that in all these, uh, for all these probabilities, 